Well, today on Travelgay.com, I'm joined by Pilot Patrick. Some of you may follow him on Instagram or YouTube. He's got a very big social following. Uh, and as a gay man, is also one of the few pilots out there uh, telling the world what it's like to travel the world as a pilot. Uh, hi, Patrick. Hey, Darren. How are you? And, very well, uh, why, thank you. Welcome on board. No, thank you very much. I'm one of your aviators now. I think that's what you call them, right? That's awesome. Really nice to hear. Nice to meet you. Um, so just tell me first, what inspired you to become a pilot? You know, it's a little bit, most pilots probably would say, oh, it's always been my dream since I'm a little child. But in my case, it was rather, I would say, kind of a development um, of course, already as a small child, I was fascinated by airplanes um, and my dad always wanted to become a pilot. So that was like one reason why I chose this career because um, he said, this is such a cool job and you have to do this. And I said, yeah, actually, why not uh, give it a try, even though um, I am also a creative person and a creative person doesn't really I would say fit to like a pilot career. Um, so when I finished um, high school and actually spent a year in, um, in the States and I had the chance to fly on board uh, a smaller piston engine aircraft and it was so much fun for me. So I think this is like one of the, and this is also another one. Um, I had the chance um, as a small child to go inside the cockpit during a flight when it was still allowed. Uh, so there were like some, some I would say, steps which led to my to led to my pilot career. I love that. I uh, I always yeah. wanted to be a pilot too, but never quite got that far. I mean, I did. I think I did about fifteen hours of flying in a Cessna one hundred and five two, but then never nice. never went solo. Uh, so well done for making it all, all the way. <laughs> How did you how did you start? Did you start flying small planes or did you go straight onto a commercial train and course? Actually, I did um, I did a fully integrated course. So I did like an up, uh, it's called a Nietzsche course where you start, we always say as a pedestrian who has zero flight hours to a commercial pilot. So this training lasts almost two years. Uh, so it was quite I would say compacted. So you start with theory, you have practical training without any major break in between. Uh, it was a stressful time, but um, also, of course, a lot of fun. We went flying in Croatia uh, to uh, Florida. So it was uh, such a, I would say, one of the best times in my pilot career. But at that time, I didn't realize this because it was so stressful and you were always worried not to pass the next check flight or the written exam. Uh, but was, what was quite awkward, um, before I decided to become a pilot, um, I, you know, I never have flown by myself, just, you know, as a passenger. And at that point, I didn't know, is this going to be really the job I want to do the rest of my life? You know, you always invested so much money to start the flight course, but you still were kind of <laughs> worried. It was like kind of an awkward feeling. Uh, but once, like from minute one, I sat in the aircraft and took off by myself for the very first time. Uh, I knew it is, it is my passion. It's something I want to do forever. <laughs> I bet, I bet that first feeling of uh, flying solo is pretty epic and scary as well, I imagine, right? Um, I think it, it went by so fast. Um, I always had, um, I wasn't really like scared to fly alone, but I always recalled my flight instructor who said, because we did our training in Croatia and uh, on that airfield, there were still some how do you say, it? like hidden missiles or bombs outside of the landing strip. So he always said, please make sure that you hit the runway because if you, you know, <laughs> might end up on, next to the runway, you might survive, but then there might be like a little bomb inside the crash. So, wow. so this was the only thing I was scared about. 
Well, I'm glad that didn't happen. I'm sure everyone who follows you is is glad too. Um, Obviously, you know, aviation and travel has had a pretty difficult time, probably the most difficult time from an industry perspective over the last year. Um, I think if any of us were sat here a year ago, we never would have predicted something something like this. How has it affected you? It is uh, crazy. I think never, nobody would ever imagine this. It is so crazy and it breaks my heart that the travel and the aviation industry is kind of affected the most in my opinion because it's going to take maybe some years even to recover to go back to the levels we had in 2019 or maybe we never come back to the level because uh, the point of view or people think differently about uh, traveling and flying uh, Um, flying especially business people maybe they don't travel so much anymore because they can see they can do it also on digital Uh, in my case um, I just started today um, uh, to like bridge the waiting time I would say with my flight instructor course so I'm becoming a flight instructor which I'm, I'm really excited about because when I started um flying as a captain, um, I noticed how much fun I have to like to pass on my experience and my knowledge to younger pilots. And I think it's a great way to do this now in a flight instructor, um, to do my flight instructor now to become even more on a more professional level, to build up my, pro- my proficiency. And from that, you can always do another rating you can become uh, an instructor or a type rating you can go uh, teach people in the simulator so yeah that's what i'm doing currently and uh, it's quite quite um, interesting fact here even though you are allowed to fly big airbus or boeing at the same time you're not automatically allowed to fly small piston engine aircraft so at first I had to revalidate my rating so I can fly smaller aircraft. And it's a little bit, you know, funny when you think about it, you know, flying big airplanes, but you're not allowed to fly the small ones at the same time. It's, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? Because from a pandemic perspective, I think people will forget fairly quickly and hopefully things will bounce back pretty quickly. It might take, you know, a year or two, but I think aviation and travel will recover to pre-pandemic levels. I think the interesting thing to think about is whether there will be a shortage of pilots. I think, you know, there's already a a lot of young pilots coming up through the ranks and training. So I guess that's what you're hoping is that your your new role as a flight instructor will help inspire them to to fill the gaps that are inevitably going to be there when it comes to a staffing and resourcing perspective. Yeah, and uh, at the same time, um, you, you are taking care about the future pilots so you can as i said um, pass on your knowledge your proficiency and uh, try to make them great pilots you have like i would in that case i am holding it in my hand you know it depends on me if you if we have um, a good pilot or not yeah for sure um, tell us a bit about um how you got into starting to document your life for social media i mean obviously you know yeah, sure. people, yeah i mean like you know you're there are very few pilots out there who kind of let you behind the scenes and you know with you we get to see a lot of your life both from a personal perspective but also a professional perspective what's what made you start doing that uh, when I started, I was one of the few ones who did this. Now there are a whole bunch of other pilots to, uh, like on social media as well. But I would say I was one of the first ones. But to be honest, it wasn't really um, planned. It was more like, I would say, uh, a coincidence. Nevertheless, I would say it's almost eight years ago, a friend, up, friend uh, showed up to me and said, hey, people are starting to blog online, why don't you, you're a private chat pilot, this is so cool, you have to do something with this, write about your life and share what you see and experience. I said, who's going to read this, you know? For me, it was obvious, for me, it was everyday life, for me, it was almost normal to see everyday a celebrity, to fly 
two nice destinations. And then a few, day, a few days, a few years later, um, you know, social media became more popular, especially Instagram. And then I said, okay, I'm going to open up a channel, but I want to rather share, share what I see with my friends and family because in a private chat, it's not like a commercial app where you can take your friends with and, or family to show what you're doing. So I wanted to take my family on board so they can see what I'm, where I'm at, uh, what I'm doing, how's like my work life looking like. And all of a sudden, I would say it's not, it was not from one to another day, but I noticed more and more people were interested about my life as a pilot, my personal life. They were super interested in, to see how uh, how it looks like or like how the pilot life is. And, you know, um, since 2011, I would say around that time, the cockpit became, you know, with a door locked and you don't know who's flying in front or you don't have like an insight um, how the work uh, looks like. So now I can basically open up a door and people have a step inside the cockpit and can see what we're doing there, uh, which is of course, um, Super interesting for most of the most of the people who are, uh, yeah, enjoy flying and traveling. Yeah. And that's how it developed. And then I noticed, okay, people want to read more, so I opened up my, you know, blog where I shared my whole story how I became a pilot. And I remember when I when I decided to become a pilot, it was so difficult. Two thousand and seven to find someone who did this training there was no you know blog where i could have a look at and i said and nowadays everything has changed now you can get more information and maybe you can decide if you want to become a pilot uh, or not even even better in terms of becoming a pilot there's quite in terms of becoming a pilot, there are very few people who put themselves out there on social media, much less so those who are openly gay. And when it comes to diversity in the cockpit, what have you seen over the last few years? It does seem that there are very few people of colour, uh, women, LGBT pilots out there. Have you seen any improvement? Yeah, I'm seeing an improvement, um, but when I started flying or decided for the aviation career, I always thought it is actually, you know, you know, people are, we live, we are working together in the aviation world. I think uh, we're traveling to different countries and um, seeing different people. I thought everyone is, you know, open, open-minded in general, but the first hint I got during my flight training in 2008 when I started, um, the first hint that it is not that diverse, I noticed when my flight instructor said, you know, women and um, people of color do not belong inside the cockpit. Wow. And I was 21 at that uh, time and I've never heard something, someone saying this. I was so shocked. I was during a flight, uh, doing an approach, so I was not you never should like argue during a flight. So at that point, I, you know, we didn't discuss this, but this showed me, okay, there's something um, wrong. Uh, um, and then over the years, I noticed this was not the only pilot who has um, a different or awkward point of view. Um, unfortunately, I think it's still kind of unhidden for people who are not involved in the aviation world because when you're flying as a passenger, you see the cabin and usually the cabin is super diverse. You have, you have gay, you have people of color, different um, races. So they are all kind of mixed, but inside the cockpit, it is still unfortunately a different world. I think it is getting better now with a different generation like growing up and um, like also I, I'm a supporter. I'm out there also on social media to highlight that we have a problem. So I hope that my social media presence also helps um, women or gay people or whosoever uh, to decide for an aviation career. 
And I can absolutely understand, I think in worldwide, for example, women, I think it's only like 7%, something around that, who are uh, working as pilot. And it's, this number is so low. And I can Im imagine that there are a lot of people out there who are kind of frightened maybe to start with the pilot career because it is white, it's dominated by, yeah, white men, so. So what would you say to someone who is thinking about training to become a pilot who is from a diverse background? Become a pilot when it's your passion, uh, when you love flying, do it because um, this will help to change the world inside the cockpit. If more and more people not decide from a smaller minority um, or race not to become a pilot, this doesn't help us in the future. So to become more diverse uh, inside the cockpit, I would say then it is important that you also uh, become a pilot and you're not, of course it can be maybe a little bit more difficult, but and um, it can be more difficult and uh, you need to be, you have a strong character, but uh, in the end, in my opinion, also in my, in my case, uh, it paid off that I stayed strong and that I followed my, my, my passion um, to fly, even though I had lots of um, walls to climb over. Well, well done to you. Uh, in terms of traveling the world as a gay man, obviously there are a lot of countries where it's illegal to be gay. That doesn't stop someone traveling to those countries. But have you had any issues traveling to specific countries because you're gay? Luckily, luckily not. So I always had uh, quite positive experiences, even though the country is maybe less LGBT friendly. Um, I was quite, you know, I did my uh, flight training in Croatia a long t a time ago, but I was there doing training. So we were always a big group going out and I was not so open with my sexuality at that time. I still had to kind of, had to find myself, I would say. Um, but I came uh, last summer, I was back in Croatia and I was, you know, it is Europe. It is only two hours from Berlin, but it was still quite a quite different world. You couldn't find any or like a really gay place. It was, it was almost a little bit like hidden everything. You know, it was not... It was not, uh, I, I still feel, I still felt super safe, but um, I was also doing a day trip to Montenegro and uh, we had this chauffeur who was driving us around in, in this Mercedes and we, we were on a ferry and I was wearing quite fancy stuff, you know, I was like a Versace shirt and I had my, wearing my shoe, jewelry and I was, I would say like a, a colorful bird and I was, uh, hidden on like um, trap on that ferry I was I didn't feel insecure but there were so many people um, you know staring at me and saying how is this guy looking and what is he doing here because they I don't know yeah Montenegro is also not that far <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, quite, well, well, quite. I think, I think, you know, look, the interesting thing is, is that you never know when you're traveling as a gay man, whether the law matches the reality, right? Because it can be, go, it can go in both ways. It can be illegal in one place, but it's actually fine, or it can be totally legal by law, but you still don't necessarily feel safe. And to be honest, um, you know, there's, um, let's say you're traveling to a destination where it's super nice you always wanted to go there and you know it is not that open-minded at that place in my opinion um, i expect people coming to my place to behave according according uh, to the regulation and to the rules and so when i'm traveling i'm also obeying their regulations so let's say it is forbidden to show um, sexual attraction in public like kissing or holding hands so of course 
And when I'm guest in the country, I'm also obeying the laws and I'm not doing this. So you have to be respectful when you're traveling. And, you know, even though there are still countries in the world who, uh, where it's more difficult as, as a gay man, look at our history uh, of Germany. It, it, it was 2017 when we are now the, the, um, the marriage with gay men uh, was allowed. It's only three and a half years ago. So it takes time, even though I be here in Germany. So give it time for other countries as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, one of the keys that we always talk about is that by traveling as a gay man or as a minority, you can be a big advocate and you can help open people's eyes. You can also uh, help inspire people who might be LGBTQ in that destination who find it difficult to show them that there is uh, the ability to be open and to be in a relationship or whatever oh, yeah. that is. Yeah, that's, that's well said. Yeah. Uh, thanks. <laughs> uh, it's my job. So you'd, you'd think that I've uh, uh, nailed that one at least. Um, so talk, talk us a bit through your, your traveling lifestyle, because obviously you're traveling quite a lot. I imagine you have to deal with jet lag quite a lot. I imagine it's hard to stay fit and healthy when you're on the road. Talk to me a bit about that in terms of how you stay fit and how you combat jet lag. You know, luckily, um, so far my aviation career didn't have to experience so much with jet lag. I'm really happy about this because I think it can be quite uh, tough for the body. And um, so luckily so far, I only have flown within uh, Europe and maybe uh, North Africa, a little bit East. So it was only about, let's say plus three hours or minus three hours. Uh, but I'm traveling um, on a private basis. Of course, I'm traveling more west or eastbound and then it can be it just, um, can be quite quite uh, quite intense for the body so there are like a certain rules especially on a blog I already shared the tons of tips how to fight fight a jet lag um, how you stay fit and there is there is always I will I would say there is always time for a little workout, even when you only have, let's say, 15 minutes, but you're in your hotel room, you can do so many body weight exercises. So um, that's, that's like my general rule. I always try to, even when it's only 10 minutes, I'm doing something. Um, then people make fun about it. <laughs> but I am traveling with a food bag. I always have my bag full of healthy food I would say. basically it's only healthy food like what kind um, of healthy food though because you can't carry like fresh carrots and things like that so what are you yeah, carrying in healthy, europe healthy of course snacks? in europe in europe you can but if you're traveling outside of course it gets a little bit more difficult um but uh, generally in inside my food bag i always carry like a protein shake i'm do i'm taking every day after sports um then i'm nuts uh, fruits, mm, uh, cereal bars, you know, lots of like healthy stuff where it's especially when you're aboard, uh, you, have, you don't have so much time to go to a supermarket or hard to find a, a nicely, uh, nice grocery store. So that's, that's my tip. If you are traveling a lot, you have to think ahead and uh, plan also your your meals and because it always can happen that was uh, during my especially during my private jet time you got to a flight order on the day and was saying oh you have only one flight but in the end we had like five flights and we were up from nine in the morning flying till late at eight o'clock and no one ordered catering for you so I always had my little back up um, food bag, you know, so I was... I thought flying a private plane was meant to be glamorous. <laughs> then, then you have to read my book because the title is The Unclamorous, um, Clamorous Life as a Private Jet Pilot. People think uh, it is all this spectacular, you know, and that's what I thought as well when I started my aviation career. It has a lot of glamorous aspects, especially when you're invited by 
by a singer to, a, to his concert or you're staying at the same nice hotel as uh, the client does, but it has also those, I would say, unglamorous yeah, aspects where, you, where the co-pilot is in charge of ordering the catering, of course, serving the passenger is always quite nice because you can have a chat with some, some famous people, but or the other, and you also have to clean the cabin after the flight. And this also includes the toilet. So yeah, it does have its unclearness. So if you had to choose um, one of these sub careers to do forever, whether that is choosing from being a private pilot a commercial pilot, or now what you're doing, uh, training other pilots, which one would you choose? A different question, because all those careers, they all have its positive I'm giving you a choice. I'm not giving you a choice. Of three. I'm giving so, you a choice of one. <laughs> it would, it would, I would say um, uh, I'm... I'm a combination between flight instructor and private jet pilot sounds quite well to me. Amazing. Okay, good. Um, you've obviously built a very big social media following over time. What's your secret to success, do you think? <sighs> secret? I would say there are a few guidelines you have to follow to be successful. Number one is to be authentic on, the, on social media. Be the same person uh, uh, like you are that you um, that you um, tell and share interesting stories that you have. I would say also a niche. Let's say in my case, of course, it's the the pilot and the uh, my pilot life in the aviation aviation world. I'm giving insights. Um, consistency that you always you know, keep your followers updated that you post regularly and that you kind of invent yourself, that you always find new topics, interesting um, stuff people are interested uh, in. I was like, it's so funny to see because there are a few things I have done already years ago which were quite successful on social media. For example, the outfit transition. Now, like everyone is doing this outfit transition. I was like, <laughs> I did this already two years ago. So of course you can follow any trend, you can follow trends, but at the same time, uh, you shouldn't do copy paste. You should uh, start thinking uh, what you can do, what others don't do. Well, you're clearly then a trailblazer if you're doing all this stuff before everyone else. So what I'm going to ask you now is where are your favorite places to travel? Because clearly they're places that now everyone's going to go to. Now you've said they're your favorite places to travel. <laughs> you mean on vacation or like flying? Both. I mean, I mean, I guess what, what what's your favorite uh, vacation? What's your favorite airport to fly into? I suppose they're quite different questions, but... Um, oh, yeah, de definitely. Um, let's start with the vacation. One of... Uh, let's stay. Uh, let's stay in Europe. My, one of my favorite, of course, I'm living in Berlin. Berlin is the best city in the world. <laughs> uh, but besides that, I love Barcelona. Uh, I lived there for like three months. Um, it's not really living, but stayed there for a longer time. And I've truly fell in love with this with this uh, place in Spain because you have the beach and you have the city right next to it. Um, you have this amazing vibe you can have those great restaurants nice places where you can stay at the people are super friendly i think barcelona is like one of the like top destinations uh, in um, in europe lisbon i think it's becoming more and more popular um, that people travel to portugal because it's a beautiful country as a small child i went there almost um, every year because my uncle is uh, from Portugal, so um, I got to know this city quite well, and I must say it's a, a, a really, really nice place to to uh, to see. Especially the architecture is just stunning. Uh, one of my travel uh, favorite destinations to travel, like let's say, um, 
long distance is Cape Town, South Africa. I've been now there three times. I'm getting right now. I'm getting goosebumps. I just think about it. I think it is an amazing place to go to because you have uh, the nature, the light. Um, I've never seen th something in my life, and um, of course, it is lacking. You still have this black and white thing there, which always kind of, um, I would say, breaks my heart to see it in, in life. Uh, but you can see things are changing there, there as well. Um, but it is with, the, with the, 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 the nature, the landscape you have there, this is, I would say, one of the kind. Uh, yeah, it's a stunning, so. stunning destination. In terms of flying, let's get a little bit technical and geeky. Tell me your favorite airports to fly into. Um, oh, there are so many nice destinations, uh, airports. I would say it is Nice and south of France, the Côte d'Azur. It's like the hotspot for the rich and famous. I really loved flying there uh, because the approach is right quite spectacular approach over the water in quite low level and then you have a visual approach which is not that common on a major airport usually you have your navigation aids and you have your instrument um, instrument approach and you have to follow this guideline but on this approach you are you have to look out and see where is the city where is the beach where is my landing strip and you have to fly it manually which is always um, a lot of fun uh, another great airport is in london uh, london london city airport i think it uh, is yeah. It is spectacular, uh, both as a passenger and pilot. And of course, as a pilot, it is absolutely challenging because um, you have this very steep approach. And the fun fact here is on the land, on the runway, they have a camera. And if you don't, if you land after this, I would say, flash, and then you are supposed to make a go around because the runway is so short, it could happen that you don't make it within the runway to stop. And if you, you're not obeying this regulation and you, you land nevertheless, even though you touch down after this light, uh, you might get a fine. So it is always a little bit of, uh, I would say, stressful uh, that excitement sounds. and stressful. And then at the same time, you have this nice view of uh, London, especially during um, great weather. Um, it is uh, at London City Airport. You fly right around the Shard as well, don't you? The the, the big skyscraper in London. Is yeah. A great and there you get have to be uh, really uh, careful, especially when you have wind. There might be some vortexes generated by the lens, uh, skyscrapers and the wind, which like go flow around uh, the skyscraper. So you have to be really, really careful uh, when flying in and out of London City. Well, you will have flown straight over my house in London then, because it goes, it's the crossing point of the London City flight path and the London Heathrow flight path. Oh. So get to see, I'm there on flight radar, like saying, oh, what's that? What's that? What's yeah, that? That's, that's fun. That. So you have a lot of noise as well, or is it? Okay? Uh, it's not too. It's not too bad. No, it's not too bad. Have you have you found it difficult to be openly gay in the job that you're in? Mm. Yeah, I'm doing social media now for four years, and um, I've never like really made uh, a statement that I said, "Okay, I am. I'm here. I'm Paul Patrick, and I'm gay." Now with my book last year, I decided, okay, I think it's the time has come to come out also to, um, yeah, to, to, to the public, I would say, um, especially um, to, to make it clear, I would say. On the other hand, um, this is now social media. In terms of work, I think we should have this level where it doesn't make a difference if you are gay, bi, trans, straight, um, because in my opinion, in an environment of work, it, 
this topic sexuality shouldn't come up. So in my point of view, uh, my colleague shouldn't come inside the cockpit and say, hey, I'm straight. But on the other side, I'm not the person who's coming inside the cockpit and say, hey, I'm gay. It, is, it should be just a normal thing, which is, of course, not, not the fact or have, we haven't reached this kind of uh, level yet. Um, but that's why I said now also on social media, also with my book, um, it is maybe a, a good time now also to, to come out. Well, look, I think you're a big advocate and I think you'll find a lot of people are inspired by the fact that you're in the career you're in. So keep on doing it because you will be inspiring younger people out there to get into that career, knowing they can, knowing that, you know, it might not always be easy. There might be a little bit of prejudice, but things are moving in the right direction. Ruth, and that's, that's super inspiring. Uh, Pilot Patrick, thank you so much for talking to us at TravelGay.com. Thank you so much and happy landings.